All right, hi everyone, welcome. So today we're talking about the book Algorithms to Live By. Uh, so this I thought was a fun read, uh, has implications if you're a computer science person, a machine learning person, and wanted to say first just a couple things about like how this session is in, in, intended to go. So, um, so today, you know, we'll have a discussion leader, I'll be the discussion leader, but really uh, the, the point of this isn't really for this just to be a one, sided conversation. So everyone's welcome to participate. You can ask questions. Um, if there's something you don't understand, something you want to know more about. Um, if you have read the book, uh, you can, if there's something that I don't mention that you thought was interesting or something that I got wrong, you can certainly share um, about that. If you're, if you're familiar with a particular topic, even if you didn't read the book, um, if it has some applicability, um, definitely, you know, interest in people sharing that. And given sort of the nature of this book, right, it, it kind of has some questions about like, well, how can this information be applied in my work or in my life? Um, and, you know, where do we see these different principles, algorithms, you know, being used in machine learning? So, um, so again, I just welcome everybody. Uh, you don't have to raise your hand or anything. Feel free to just, you know, unmute, ask a question. Um, if your microphone isn't working, you can use the chat, although I'm currently on a single screen, and so I'm just going to ask Ryan to monitor the chat if there's an actual question that we want to pause and talk about, because I just have found it too difficult to get my chat window to behave. I'm going to have to solve that, get a second screen. All right, so in terms of this book, um, the authors talk about, you know, computer scientists have been solving problems on computers, but in many ways they're analogous to human decisions because computers have finite resources. They have resources in terms of time, in terms of, of memory, and even an idea like um, a computer that's running multiple programs technically can't run multiple programs simultaneously. It's switching back and forth. And so a decision like, should I keep going or should I switch? Well, that has lots of analogies to decisions people make in terms of should I keep doing X or should I switch, right? Should I stay at my job? Should I switch? Should I keep looking for a better offer or should I just take this one? All those kinds of things. Um, so they, in this book, try to, try to draw connections and basically show examples of algorithms from computer science so that people can sort of draw upon that and say, oh, I can actually steal something from what people have learned by programming computers. And so algorithm, I don't think this is uh, um, uh, something too heady, right? They say it's just a finite sequence of steps used to solve a problem. And they give examples that, you know, we follow algorithms all the time. So a cookbook recipe, I follow recipes all the time. Um, and I'm doing things in a particular, uh, doing sequence of steps in a particular order as prescribed. And out comes the dish, usually pretty good. Um, they say if you're, you know, knitting a sweater or something, then there's a certain pattern of, how many times you knit, how many times you purl, this, that, how many in a row, and you'll get the shape and you'll get the pattern that you're looking for. Um, so this book provides a vocabulary for discussing challenges. And ultimately the goal is to say, okay, here's some challenges faced by computers and what can we as humans learn from this? So that's kind of the setup. Um, so the thing that I will say is that reading this book you know, I thought it was a really fun, interesting read. There were a few places where I felt it was applicable to me personally, and other places it was just like, oh, that's cool. I didn't realize that, you know, this is what libraries do, or this is what whatever does, um, or this is how this came about. Uh, but more, but those parts were sort of more like algorithms in the real world, as opposed to algorithms to live my life by, right? So I'm going to highlight a few places where I actually took something away from this book. I'm like, oh, I, I can actually use that in my life. But I'll just say that um, I think it's a very catchy title, but perhaps, you know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying they should have changed the title, but, but for me, it was a little bit more about algorithms in the world. And not every chapter was really about something that, you know, I could live by. All right. So with that said, basically, um, I've got some, some notes here. Um, in the slides, and you know, the plan is basically uh, to to just introduce some of the material from each of the chapters, and and then invite discussion. Again, so questions, things that you want to add, if there's something that you know you took away from it, um, 
And so really it kind of depends, you know, if people have a lot to say, I, I'm not quite sure uh, how the idea, the plan for doing the entire book in approximately an hour. I'm not quite sure how that's going to go, uh, but, but I'm happy to find out either way. I mean, if people are really invigorated by the conversation, if, if we decide we want to spend more time on it, then theoretically we could, we could continue. Uh, we could continue next Saturday, um, or, you know, we may go, go through all of this. Um, but there are some things that for me personally, I thought I would share and highlight. And in particular, in two weeks, the next book we're going to read uh, relates to reinforcement learning. And so um, in addition to just machine learning in general, there's a few places where um, there's some things that tie in to reinforcement learning. So, so Ted, you're saying that you didn't discover an optimal scheduling algorithm for one book, one hour? <laughs> well, if, if this were a really boring lecture where I did all the talking, I could have timed it, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, so I'm actually hoping that you guys will have comments, uh, contributions, you know, some of you, for example, first chapter, optimal stopping. Some of you may know things about optimal stopping. And so I'd love to hear um, from other people um, I don't think this will be nearly as, as interesting or as fun or as informative if it's, if it's just me doing um, a lot of the talking. All right, so uh, the first chapter, Optimal Stopping, I thought that this was in many ways one of the, one of the best chapters. So, so it seems uh, that they did a good, made a good choice in terms of putting it up front, having that be sort of the sample chapter. If you open the book and you start reading from the beginning, you're like, oh, this is really, you know, really interesting. Um, so the, the, the nut of it is that, you know, they, they talk about this, this thing that's been named the secretary problem. Uh, but basically the idea is um, if you're trying to hire someone and if you use really strict assumptions, so you assume that, you know, if you make an offer, the person's gonna say yes. And if you don't make an offer, they're just gone forever. You never have a chance to go back to them. Um, and so it means that you, you have this really hard choice, either hire this person that you've seen or wait for another candidate. And so then the question is, well, how long should you keep searching? And at what point should you strike uh, um, and hire someone if, if, if you like them? And so this problem turns out it has a, a, a specific hard, you know, optimal solution, which says that you should spend 37% of your time um, searching and you shouldn't make an offer to anyone. So if you know that you want to get someone hired within say a month, then spend 37% of that time um, evaluating the candidates, getting a sense for um, who's out there, what the possibilities are. And then after that, um, the first person that's, that's the best that you've seen, um, you go and you hire that person. And, um, and so the, the, the book, you know, gives a number of examples of different things that, that you could be uh, searching for, not just, you know, hiring somebody. And it turns out that in this sort of weird symmetry that if you do this, then the omniscient, you know, way of looking at things. Hold on one sec. <coughs> I'm sorry about that, excuse me. Um, you have a 37% chance of actually picking the very best candidate that is going to present themselves um, within, within a month within that time frame that you picked. Um, and it's kind of funny that 37% uh, of picking the very best candidate is in my opinion, not that high, right? But on the flip side of it, um, it doesn't say that if you don't get the absolute very best candidate, then you know, you're gonna get a horrible candidate, right? So, so in that light, I think, you know, like 37% chance of getting the absolute very best candidate. And then, you know, whatever the numbers are for getting this, you know, one of the top three or something like that, that's not really, really uh, too bad. Um, and then, you know, slight tweak on the way of looking at the problem. If you, if you, instead of coming into the situation knowing absolutely nothing, um, which is the way the problem's posed. So you're spending 30% of the time getting a lay of the land. So normally if you're gonna go buy a house or whatever, you don't just go in there and you spend 30% of your time just trying to get a lay of the land find a realtor who's supposed to already know the market, right? Um, and so then you're not gonna spend nearly as much time evaluating because now you, you have you know, better background information. And so it says, then you can chance, increase your chance of picking the absolute very best up to 58%, which you know, 
again, I think that if you consider that, if you don't get that, you're still getting a pretty good one. Those are those are pretty decent odds. But um, but again, uh, from the grand scheme of like perfect optimality, 58% doesn't seem that high to me. <laughs> um, and so then another example they give, which I found, you know, very much relatable, is you're looking for a parking spot. And it turns out that you can't just use a simple number like 37% or 58% because the optimal stopping depends on the occupancy rate. So how full the parking is. So if the place is deserted and nine out of every 10 parking spaces um, are empty, there's no reason for you to take a parking space before you get to your destination. You should just go right to the destination and hope that there's a parking spot right there. When the parking spaces are 95% full, then you know you're like, well, if I see a spot and it's fairly close, then maybe I should actually uh, grab it because maybe there won't be one closer. And in fact, once I pass, you know, my destination, maybe I won't find another one for a really long time. So then the chapter ends by saying that they've done research on what do people actually do, and and people tend to stop a little earlier than the math would say to do so, rather than stopping a little bit later. Um, but these analyses. They don't factor in sort of the, the, the time cost. I'm sorry, hold on one second, guys. Sorry about that. So so actually, if you if you factor in not just the time cost in terms of like actual cost cost, but just just sort of the uh, um, the pain of it, you know, I don't enjoy, you know, searching for an apartment to rent. I don't enjoy searching for a candidate for a position. Um, so in fact, maybe, in fact, it, it is somewhat optimal to, if you factor that in, to stop a little bit earlier than, than the math would otherwise say. All right, so I'm gonna pause here. Um, any comments, questions, thoughts about uh, optimal stopping? Yeah, for finding a, Parking spot. My experience is for a fully, you know, compact parking space. You just uh, find the best spot you can see all the cars. Just wait there. I think you wait instead of loop. When you loop, you never find a parking spot. But you just <laughs> stand still, wait, and maybe five or ten minutes, somebody will leave for sure. I've, I've seen that strategy employed a lot at Costco. Just, just so you know. <laughs> Instead of driving around, people just will sort of stop and, and wait for somebody to leave on, on, the, on the aisle that they're in, right? Yes. <laughs> All right. Any yeah. other comments? Yeah, I had a thought too, say also on the parking spots. So the, the number that struck me was that the author was recommending 85% just because of the significant jump from 85 up to 90%. So he, he was kind of lamenting whatever cities or I guess um, paid parking spots, et cetera, that were trying to get full occupancy because it just wastes everybody's time. But I'm kind of wondering with that 85% and valet parking. So I'm kind of wondering, so did valet parking, when is it efficient to do valet parking? So that kind of might be an interesting uh, formula to put in there too. Yeah, and I don't remember, Anne. I think uh, I think there may have been something there that said that if you have dynamic parking prices, okay, and so you raise the cost of parking until you drive occupancy down to eighty five percent, then you're not necessarily bringing in less revenue than you would with full occupancy at flat parking rates, right? Yeah. Um, but but maybe you you make everybody's life happier because it's relatively fast and easy instead of them you know spending a lot of time circling around looking for parking. Uh, I once was uh, at presentation where a guy considered different dating strategies, and he said that statistically, <clears throat> the best one is that you date at first three people and you dump all of them. And then you need to pick up the first one, which is better out of these three than any of these three. And the success rate, he said, is 40%. 
So if you consider that divorce rate is about 50%, uh, statistic doesn't help much here. And another thing that, for example, my niece um, has uh, rather, well, uh, her dating is <clears throat> very unsuccessful because it is very happen rarely, rarely happens to her when she's attracted to a guy and, and he's interesting, interested and free. So it happens only once in her life. When she was in her late 30s, she grabbed him and got married. But, you know, what kind of strategy would be good for her, I wonder. Just, you know, thinking aloud. Yeah, I, I, I don't I think, think dating is easy. Yeah, I think me. psychology trumps statistics always. <laughs> so just just pointing at this principle some more. So the 37%, that's the recommendation to hope to find you the absolute best option out of all of the set, right? But what if there's- if you, if you know absolutely nothing about the quality of the set to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what if, I mean, there might be plenty of scenarios like in a parking scenario where it's like there's lots of options where the difference between them is is very, very small. So actually investing the additional time, if the parking lot's empty and you can choose between the one that's right at the door and the one that's next to it and next to it and next to it, like you're not going to spend 37% of your time looking for a spot. You're just going to take one that's acceptable. Yeah. Many, many years ago, I worked with this guy, Tim, in Berkeley. So Tim, if you're out there, hi. Um, and he would never park more than one block away from the restaurant or the bar, wherever we were going. Um, and I was actually quite surprised in that he would loop like three, four times. I mean, parking is not impossible, but it's not easy to find in Berkeley. And he would loop, loop three or four times. And you know, pretty much without too much uh, uh, pain, he would find a parking spot like within a block of wherever we were going. And so whatever that occupancy rate was, I don't, I don't really know, you know, I would say that uh, for him, he did not consider those parking spaces to be somewhat equivalent. And he actually like really mastered that that strategy. But yes, if, if you don't care whether you're one block or three blocks away, then then probably for me, I would say, yeah, the, 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 the least stress is just you find one that's reasonable, good enough, then so what if there's a better one, right? I don't really care. At least I wasn't frustrated. Mm -hmm. So um, I actually had a question with this though too, because um, I guess this is assuming you've determined what your maximum amount of time is you're going to spend on a topic, right? That's the assumption. So I thought it was interesting seeing the examples of like, like the parking spot, for example, right? Because I mean, granted, I guess I don't want to spend an hour in there, but maybe I'll go 30 minutes to get an optimal spot at a Costco. But that, that's what I think is interesting, like that variance of time. Yeah. Yeah. None of these things, they, they don't, um, let's see, where's my fancy little thing here. No, here we go. No, none of these things uh, factor in the, the, the time formally. So, um, so you have to decide what your time is worth, right? Some people would say, I don't mind spending half an hour looking for, I don't mind spending 10 minutes. If you're somebody who doesn't even want to spend five minutes, then just, you know, go you can drive farther away when you see a spot just take it you know so 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 yes it, it depends on how you, you factor that part in all right cool so then the the second chapter is on explore exploit and that's the one that ties um um kind of the most with reinforcement learning so i actually uh, saved that one for last we'll, we'll see whether that's actually a, a, a good or a bad strategy, because if we run over time, that means we won't, we won't get to it at all. So we'll be, be sort of whatever, maximum unoptimality. Um, all right, so, so the next chapter to talk about, chapter three, uh, sorting, 
Um, so just so you guys know, you know, my background was in computer science. Um, so a lot of these topics are very familiar to me. So we're familiar, we talk about uh, in, in fairly early on in computer science, we talk about sorting. So the author introduces big O notation. So this is where you're just talking about sort of the leading term on things. And when you get to large numbers, large N, then the leading term dominates. So, um, you know, if you have something that's, that's say quadratic in time and squared when N is 10 million, it doesn't really matter whether it's, you know, N squared plus 2N or N squared plus 1N or N squared plus 4N, um, you know, 4N is gonna be teeny tiny compared to 100 million squared. Um, so simple sorts are quadratic. Some of them are uh, what they call linear rhythmic, which means um, um, n times the log of n. So um, the key thing in computer science is that the log of n for large numbers n is way, 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 way smaller than n. So n log n is a lot smaller than um, n squared. So if you just use my example of 100 million, if you use log base 10, um, you know, 100 million squared is 100 million times 100 million, but uh, n log n uh, for 100 million is just eight times 100 million. So that, that's a really huge difference between 100 million times 100 million and eight times 100 million. Uh, they also talk about bucket sort, which isn't actually fully sorting, it's just sorting into uh, m buckets. And so if m is relatively small, you can treat it like a constant. And so you can say that it's it's uh, like linear time. And then something which, you know, I've uh, thought about, uh, I used to be much, much more, more into sports. And the reality is that sports tournaments, they pick a winner, they don't do a full sort. And so if your favorite team loses to the eventual winner in the second round, I don't know, like maybe if they hadn't run into them that early, they could have made it to the finals. Maybe, you know, assuming they would have still lost, but then they'd be the, the runner up instead of just an early bounce, right? So there are some things that sports tournaments do with seeding and whatnot, you know, to try to uh, sort of avoid that. But the, at the end of the day, for the most part, these tournaments aren't really designed to do a full sort. Um, and then goes on and talks about that if you sign a cardinal number, so if you sign a real number, a score, then you don't need to do all this pairwise kind of stuff. So if you have a marathon, a race, uh, uh, whatever, you know, you, you, if it's the fastest, whatever, you know, swimmer, whatever, uh, then you all you need is just basically their time. That's their score. And so then the best, you know, the best time wins. And so that's where you have um, even below linear. You basically, you theoretically in, one, or if it's just kind of impractical, you could say we'll have four heats, but basically the bottom line is whoever's the fastest is the fastest. You don't need to do all this head-to-head -head comparison. Um, and so one thing that, that uh, I did take away from this chapter is the author makes the, this comment that sort is prophylaxis for search. Um, so the more you sort, uh, the more you have this indexing, this metadata that's prepared in advance, the faster your search is going to be. But if the purpose of sort, of sort is to speed up search, then if your search is already fast, theoretically, you don't need to be wasting time doing a lot of sorting. Um, and so I'll give you two examples from my life. Uh, um, so the author says, sorting emails a waste when searching is so fast. So I read this, and I actually, I first read this book about a year ago. And so I actually took this on. I used to feel guilty about not filing emails into neat folders and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I use Outlook at work. And I don't know about other tools, but in Outlook, you can pretty readily find anything. So you can say, I want to search for something from this person, or you can say with this subject, or you can say some combination from this person with this keyword, whatever, with this client keyword and this other keyword. I can pretty much find any email. It doesn't need to be in any particular folder. So I have a couple folders where I have certain key things, if it's like key uh, company stuff or key client stuff that I do, you know, put in a couple folders for convenience. Um, but I've stopped feeling guilty. So, so I have all these, these emails just sitting in my inbox. I either delete them or they're sitting in my inbox and, and I, I no longer feel guilty about it. Um, the other thing um, that I can share, which, which some of you may be 
be impressed at just sort of how anal I am about things. Um, but in my kitchen, um, we have a number of spices. We don't have, we're not amazing cooks. We don't have a gazillion spices, but I would say that we probably have, I don't know, 40 spice jars or something like that. And, um, and I keep them in alphabetical order. Uh, I, I, I don't know, maybe somebody else here does. I haven't actually run into anybody who ever volunteered the fact that they also do this. Um, but it's very easy if you have your spices in alphabetical order when you're putting them away to just put it back in the same empty spot where it came from. Um, and in this case, you know, it's almost a nightly routine where I'm searching for a particular spice jar. I don't use all of them, but I usually use at least two or three spices every night. Um, and so in this case, uh, I do personally find that the sorting is something that I kind of only need to do once. I don't need to sort every night um, because I'm just putting jars back where they came from. Uh, and I find that this dramatically speeds up when I'm just saying I need, you know, the cumin, the coriander, the whatever. So, um, so I don't know if you guys think I'm nuts, but anyway, those are, <laughs> those are two of the things from me. So what are you guys' thoughts about, whoops, sorting? I sort my spices too, because I have a lot of them and there are like, you know, four rows deep of spices. And yes. how actually you would find something there. I have a little tiered step thing so that my four rows of spices, I can see sort of each one. Well, still. Because, you know, know, like they sell these like know, round things, but the round things are not very good because you can only see like something at a time. Mm, yes, this is true. <laughs> Anybody else brave enough to say they sort their spices? <laughs> I categorize them because they come in different sized containers. So what we have to do is remember, is that a big container spice or a small container spice or medium? <laughs> yeah. I, I think that I'm on the, on the side of the spectrum where my, my search is good enough that I don't need to sort because I just remember like, oh, this is where that was. And so I can just go and grab it. I don't have to actually like look through the organization of it, but I don't know. Yeah, just wait till you have a family and other people don't put things back where they got them. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> or when you have at least 45 different kinds. Yeah, we have this one really big thing of garlic salt that we use a lot. And, uh, and so, yeah, and that's in its own category. It doesn't fit with the others. All right. Um, I included on here just a, um, an animation showing different sort algorithms. You can do a search. You can uh, find any number of these really easy. This is just sort of the first one that I stumbled across. Um, and so if you're curious about sorting algorithms, I mean, computer scientists love to talk about sorting algorithms. It's like, there's probably, I don't even know, hundreds of sorting algorithms that have been invented. And it's not like you really need any more after the first you know, dozen but that won't stop them from continuing to find more. So um, I find it pretty interesting. And like, if you look at the, the merge sort, it's actually kind of fast, but, oh, sorry, I'm pointing at my screen and you can't see me point at my screen. Uh, but for the merge sort, you'll see that before it gets to fully sorted, it always has two lists, right? The second to last step is it has two lists that are each monotonically increasing and then boom, it interleaves them and you've got a fully sorted list. Um, some of these other ones, it's not as, well, the slower ones, you can sort of see what it's doing. But for some of the fast ones, it's not as obvious uh, just by looking at it, what they're, what they're doing. Um, I don't, it's been too long. I don't remember exactly how shell sort works. I know it's really fast. It's a cool algorithm, but I don't remember exactly how it manages to do its thing. All right. Uh, next was talking about caching. I don't have as much to say about caching. Uh, basically, you know, there's this pattern you see of a hierarchy of memories going from smaller and faster to larger and slower. And you can look at this any way you want. You can look at multiple caches on a, actually on the CPU. You can look at external caches. You can talk about memory versus disk and 
all sorts of things. And in fact, disks themselves have caches usually on them. They don't just serve things from the disk. If you ask for to read something that's that's recently been pulled, uh, the disk controller will send it to you without actually reading it off the disk. So caches like live, live everywhere. And for the most part, people have come to agree that the least recently used algorithm um, is how you decide when you need to put something new and you have no room, um, how do you decide which old entry you're gonna get rid of? Um, and so then in the chapter talks about different places where you could apply LRU. You could apply it to like your clothes, you could apply it to papers that you file. Um, I thought it was pretty interesting, like having a box where like, you know, the guy just puts the, the most recently used thing on the left. And then when he's looking for something, you know, I don't feel like I could be comfortable using that algorithm if things exceeded one box. If they all fit in one box, I could use that algorithm. But once you start imagining having multiple boxes, then, then, then I don't know. But, but I do actually have a pile on my desk. And so it's like bills I need to pay and things like that. They stay at the top. And then, you know, once they get dealt with, then I don't really care about them anymore. And so I guess that's one place where I, I sort of do that. I thought it was interesting, sort of this idea of um, if you sort of map uh, sort of how this eviction pattern looks, um, then then this is the, 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 the data that Ebbinghaus um, you know, recorded in terms of his self-experiment, trying to memorize things. Um, and then, you know, here's data that shows like the frequency that words appear um, in, in New York Times articles. And so it's, it's kind of interesting to say that maybe in fact, human memory um, has caching and it is relatively uh, optimized. Um, we, we, we think of memory as, as as being very fallible because we want it to be perfect. But given the concept of sort of fixed size and caching, then, then, then maybe we cut ourselves some slack. Maybe actually our memories are working um, as optimally as you could possibly expect a memory to work. Anybody else have any questions or anything they wanted to add? Anybody actually, uh, uh, utilize LRU in your life or something? So surprisingly, I used to use LRU for, you know, you talk about clothes there. I used to use LRU where I have, these are the shirts that I like to wear. And so I tended to wear them over and over again. And I found that I burned them out too quickly. So I've since gone to this thing where I basically do that, you know, empty the drawer. <laughs> so I go through all of them once all of, you know, the, they'll get cleaned in between, but like, you know, the clean ones don't go into the drawer. They go into a stash. And then once the drawer is empty, I then pull it back in. So it's kind of interesting from the standpoint of like LRU allowing, yeah, uh, um, you know, just to like really like I had t-shirts that were falling apart because I really liked them. So I wore yeah. them like, yeah every week um so it's it's interesting and so i think you combine the LRU a, a more or less you. you switched to more or less a fifo uh to use the computer term first in first out um i mean uh yeah yeah i mean maybe okay. maybe you do it in batches but but basically it's like the the thing that went in the thing that's the oldest, the thing that's been there the longest is what you're gonna pull out and then you're gonna stick the laundry, the new laundry sort of at the bottom at the end of the queue. Yeah. I, I always thought of it in a, as a queue standpoint. That's why I'm like tripping. It's like, to me, it's more of a, a quota bucket and I just empty the bucket until, you know, but. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I, I think I, you're doing think it in FIFO batches, but but dare I say it's, it's, it's FIFO batches. Yeah. So I always forget her name. Who's the, um, the, the, the Japanese organization? What's her name? Michio or whatever. Kondo. Yes. Marie Kondo. Yes. Yeah, Marie Kondo. So, so joy. yes, exactly. So I was going to say, <laughs> you know, I don't know, Chris, she might say if, 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 if that, if that t-shirt and those shorts spark joy, then you should just 
wear them till till they have holes and then and then find a new one that sparks joy i i, I have so no... she's she's for an lru lru is a clean mind or i can't remember well that. the other thing that she's famous for it's is get rid of all the stuff that doesn't spark joy yeah so so if you did that then regardless of what order whether you did first in first out or at least recently used the only choices you'd have would be like the five t-shirts and the three shorts that spark joy. And so then you yeah. would just love what you're wearing. And so then I, I don't know, I have never read any of her stuff, but I don't know if she talks about the challenge of finding things that actually spark joy. No, she doesn't. And she doesn't say anything about uh, what to do when the procedure of getting rid of stuff spark not joy but something extremely opposite <laughs> I, I even though I, I haven't read her stuff and I, I could always forget her name but but I do I do um, I do feel a little guilty about like throwing things away or whatever and, and so I do think about her and I try to be a little bit kinder on myself it's like yeah but you know it's like, my mom gave this to me and I never liked it. Like, why, why, why should I keep wearing it? <laughs> All right, anything else? All right, scheduling. Um, so again, I, I don't know. Uh, I'll be interested to see if people have really applied this so much to their lives. Like I said, there's algorithms in the world versus algorithms, um, you know, to live my life by. Um, so chapter starts with some different uh, single machine scheduling problems. And, and so the key thing there is you need to choose the metric that is most important to you. So is it is it the number of things that are late or the amount that they're late by or whatever? And so you get these algorithms like earliest due, shortest processing time, and you can also weight it. So you can have sort of like weighted importance. Um, I did think it was interesting that, that they talked about uh, priority inversion happened to Mars Pathfinder. So what happened is there's a low priority task but basically the way things work in computers, it had a resource locked. It was allocated to it. And because of that, nobody else could use that, that, that resource. And so this really high priority task, even though the operating system sort of came up and said, I want you to run, basically it couldn't run because it didn't have the resources that it needed. And so the operating system ended up doing a bunch of these medium importance tasks instead of. But it was interesting when they then said like, they gave the example of, uh, I think it was moving in the rental truck, you know, that, that in real life, you sometimes do get this thing where there's this one task that's not that important, um, but it's blocking something that's super important. And so then the way you solve this in a computer is, is this priority inheritance, where then you say, if it's blocking something high priority, it needs to be escalated itself to high priority. And I do think that that can be applied in your life uh, but I'm not sure that I necessarily have ever done that in a, in a formal way. Um, and then they also talk about like um, constraints and other changes to the problem means that the optimal algorithm most of the time is, is an intractable problem. Um, and one of the things that helps is preemption. So in a perfect world where you can just like bing, you know, start doing this. And then if you realize you should be doing something else, bing, zip over to that other thing. But the reality is that there's usually a cost of switching. So, you know, if you have some factory and you're assembling, you know, widgets and you decide, oh, I, I have a really important order for an important customer. So I really want to be making wonkets instead of widgets. Well, you cannot just instantly start making wonkets. There's, there's, there's a cost to switching over the assembly line. And so this, con this, this context switching cost occurs, you know, pretty much any time you switch from doing one thing to another. I've seen a bunch of stuff that says don't multitask because the reality is we all suck at it. Uh, I have not yet personally taken that to heart. I, I haven't figured out how to apply that wisdom. But so anyway, uh, interested to see if anybody here has actually 
used in your life prior to inheritance, or if you've actually figured out a way to reduce the amount of multitasking you do. Well, so I find it interesting. Or, go ahead. I, I just say reducing uh, multitasking is work from home. That, that's all I have to say. So you don't you don't uh, get distracted by other things when you're working from home, Anne? Oh, actually, no, I don't. Good for I, you. I come in, sit down at my desk with all the monitors. I immediately am immersed in the work time zone, so I am at work. Nice. All right. Well, if anybody has challenges with that, you can you can go and you can message Anne and, and ask her. And, and I will ask the answer when I get to the point when I answer such questions, yes. <laughs> so I, right. I apologize for interrupting uh, the other person. So sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think that was Chris. No <clears throat> yeah, no worries. Um, I was just gonna say, I find it funny, you know, I put so much in, I, I realize they're, you know, computer scientists, um, but there's a lot of stuff with regards to software engineering and how all of that's managed right now from from like agile and, and other methods where you hear stuff like weighted shortest first and and you know obviously everything has priorities and and all of that gets blocked together which i i find kind of funny um that that's not mentioned even though it's some clear examples in this mm. um and then i think the second thing is all these kind of talk about time scheduling um when it you know some other parallels from like resource scheduling and you can agree or disagree with with some of them but it's like oh how do you manage your debts right do you pay your smallest debt first do you pay your largest debt first do you pay the highest rate first like you know you kind of have this same kind of thing where you have to schedule how your funds flow to that even though that's not necessarily time-based it's more you know, resource based and, and mm -hmm. how that's coming, which is just interesting parallels. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay. So the next chapter, they talk about Bayes rule. Now, you know, I've seen Bayes rule a lot. I thought it was interesting that they really narrowed their discussion of Bayes rule to say, predict how much longer something will last. Um, and so I thought that was kind of, uh, in some ways it made it more approachable because, because now you've got a very narrow problem. And so uh, then they came up with these four, you know, different scenarios. If you know absolutely nothing, if you have uninformative priors, then you have the Copernican principles, just basically however long it's been, just predict that that's how much longer um, it will continue to go. And so, kind of interesting, right? The United States is very young as a country. And so um, they're, they're saying, if you, if you really don't understand what the principle of what makes countries, empires, you know, last, then you ought to predict a shorter number for the United States than for all the other countries out there. Um, and so uh, for me, that was a little bit thought provoking. And then you have, uh, you know, power law distributions, so things like city sizes. And so uh, then if you know that that's the distribution you're coming from, then you would uh, basically, right, do this multiplicative rule, I believe it is. Um, normal distribution we see all the time. So then you're expecting something around the mean. And then um, they talk about the Erlang distribution. So um, then if you have random events, independent events like a roulette wheel, um, then of course you you basically um, are making the same prediction, you know, regardless, doesn't really, the history doesn't really matter. So in a nutshell, the, uh, the message is that if you wanna make good predictions, you need good priors. And I think we could probably have a whole session, you know, talking about this, but basically, um, is the news giving you accurate priors, right? There's, there's studies that show that um, over time, you know, certain bad news like murders have been far more disproportionately talked about in the news. And so you might think that things are getting more dangerous even, 
even as crime drops, if the news is talking, spending more minutes talking about them than they used to, right? Um, there's lots of stuff that say, you know, people online in, you know, in some kind of bubble, doesn't matter if it's a conservative bubble or a liberal bubble or a, you know, whatever. I love, you know, whatever. I love parrots bubble uh, uh, that, that possibly you don't have really good priors if you're, if you're living inside of some sort of bubble. Um, and then, you know, I think we could talk about Bayes rule, you know, kind of ad infinitum when it comes to machine learning. So there's obviously lots of algorithms that fundamentally are built on, you know, Bayesian inference. But even without that, even just like, you know, simple, if you're doing some kind of supervised learning, if you have class imbalance in, um, in a classification task, that imbalance is going to show up in your model if you don't do something about it. Um, and so just understanding those kinds of things. Um, so those are some of my thoughts about Bayes' rule. Anybody else, any thoughts? All right, I will say that, that um, I understand Bayes' rule and I understand that if you know something about, so talking conditional probability, if conditional probability, I know something about the world because I have the conditional probability of A given B, I really get that that then gives me information such that I know a little bit more about B given A. I can't say, however, though, that Bayes' rule is intuitive for me. I, I, I don't remember the rule, I have to look it up. And then in order to apply it, I have to really just kind of like chunk through. It, it's, it's, it's definitely not something for me yet that, that just sort of, you know, automatically just flows. Bayesian rules could be explained in terms of frequencies. And then it is more human friendly. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. I'll be going to cover uh, confidence intervals in the future. Uh, no, um, I don't. I don't have anything right now. Uh, ah, okay. Intervals. And because I, um, I once saw a presentation about uh, prediction of times for completing a particular task. It was at Qualcomm, and this woman was. I think she was a, a department head department at this point at Qualcomm, and they needed. They had a problem that engineers would ask for more time and it, what is even worse for more memory in advance because they wanted to be covered. So they needed some kind of prediction uh, to establish what kind of time and uh, computer resources they need. And they come up actually with a prediction of this prediction using logarithm uh, regression because she said it allows not just give the prediction, but it yields, in addition, it's provide confidence intervals for this prediction. So they would pick up something like a topper 95%, and it still was much less than engineers would ask themselves. Mm. So it was a huge economy. But regretfully, uh, logistic regression even, you know, less understandable than bias rule. All right, thanks, Maya. Uh, question, does anyone have experience uh, saying that Bayes rule models are doing much better than other models? I mean, are there any specific examples where you have seen that? Well, can I ask, uh, is there something in particular your referring to when you say Bayes rules models, because man, there's a lot of Bayes rules underlying a lot of models. Well, I mean, main base uh, in machine learning, right? I mean, does it do, are there any situations or problems where that model would do better than any other models? Because I have not seen it do better on any problems that I've tried. Uh, I've, I have not used naive Bayes in uh, an actual work task. It seems to me where you might do this is where you don't have a lot of data and and then naive Bayes won't overfit. Anybody else 
have any? Ed, Brian put something in chat. Okay. This is just a general link. I, I just, it was actually in the Bayesian statistics, the fun way book. And I had been taught it in school a long time ago and it just never really made sense or clicked for me. And then they showed it as like overlapping Legos. And I can't, I can't do the explanation justice off the fly, but that blog post kind of shows the process as, as just overlapping distributions of the Legos and it, it, it finally clicked for me in that. All right. Well, I have the book. That was actually the book that I uh, had with me in case for some reason I had to wait um, in line when I was getting my vaccination. But there was no line, so I only got to read one paragraph. Yeah. Which book you guys are talking about again? Which book? It, it's called Bayesian Statistics, The Fun Way. I can link to that too. It's actually free online. Oh, here it is. So from my understanding, Bayes' rule, you know, it's more like a traditional statistical methods. So my question is how much, you know, the modern machine learning, you know, deep learning stuff using these Bayes' rule and how successful? Do you guys have some idea? Um, my super high level comment is as a practitioner, I don't feel like generally you need to be that first because it's baked into the model. But the people who created those techniques and those models, Bayes' rule kind of creeps up in just so many different ways, um, whether you realize it or not. Um, but like, you know, if I'm building an NLP model or a GAN, I, I don't necessarily even need to know that actually people were thinking about Bayes' rules when they were designing some of the architecture or whatever. Okay. Anybody else? All right. So um, next chapter was overfitting. I loved the fact that overfitting was talked about in a book that was not strictly a machine learning data science uh, kind of a book. Um, I'm assuming most people here uh, are, are familiar with overfitting. So I didn't actually include any of the notes where they explain overfitting. And so rather than showing like, you know, the nine points that can be fitted with a line or, you know, worst case, a ninth degree polynomial that's vastly overfitting. Um, I figured just a pair of memes showing like, you know, taking the design of something from more or less one data point and overfitting it. Uh, uh, just how humorous that can kind of get. So, uh, Interesting to me to see the authors say, once you know about overfitting, you see it everywhere. Because I had always thought like, oh, overfitting is this thing that, that we talk about, but nobody else knows the heck, what the heck we're talking about. Um, but they say, you know, hey, you know, if you only eat what tastes good, that's not necessarily healthy for you. Um, if you have incentives, people are gonna basically game to maximize the incentive, regardless of whether that's actually, you know, the, the, the goal that you really have in mind. Um, and they gave that, that example of like, you know, uh, police, you know, who will stop in the middle of a gunfight to pick up their, their shell casings uh, just because they've practiced that. Um, even though that's not logically something you would ever do if somebody's still shooting back at you. Um, and even another example of, um, you know, if you count page views, then you can create pathological behaviors just to drive page views. That's not necessarily the actual value for your, your website. And so um, I hate clickbait and, you know, um, I think that that's one of sort of, again, where you're sort of pandering to a metric as opposed to actually trying to, you know, create value. So who knew we would see cross-validation talked about again in a book that's not strictly about uh, machine learning. Um, pretty cool. And so um, they mentioned that Ironically, when you do cross validation, so if you do five fold cross validation, each of the folds is trained on only 80% of your data. So you're really giving it less data to do the fitting. 
And so that's sort of the price that you pay. Um, theoretically, if you can optimize training, then what you can do is you can then rerun that training on the full data set um, after you've sort of uh, found you know, the right hyperparameters to avoid overfitting. Um, and then they talk about using an alternate met metric to double check. So I, I don't remember exactly what the example was, but you're doing blah, blah, blah. And they say, you don't have to then check every single one. You could just sit sample, say, you know, one out of 100, just to see if you're overfitting and you're careening off into, you know, the wrong direction. And so I kind of had a question for myself. I wonder if there's a way we could use this in machine learning to say, uh, we'll use some alternate metric to see if our primary metric is actually driving us to an overfit state. But I didn't spend that much time thinking about it, and I, I don't know if 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 there's a practical way um, to do that to sort of see if if uh, um, I mean cross validation I think works really well. So if you if you start to see as your training loss decreases, if your validation loss starts to rise, you're you're going into overfit territory. But I don't know if instead of using a validation set, if you could somehow use a secondary metric, then if that secondary metric continues to fall. But while training on the full training set, if that starts to rise, even though your metric is falling, maybe that's a way you could also avoid overfitting. But I haven't really thought it through. All right, open floor, anybody? Any comments about overfitting? Um, when you say metric, um, are you identifying that as like accuracy and like F1 score and things like that or? Yeah, so, so, so like if I'm doing a regression, well, let's say I'm doing a classification problem. If, if, if I'm training, say some kind of neural network, let's say it's a CNN for image classification. And let's just say hypothetically, I use accuracy as my primary metric. Could I use F1 score? as a secondary metric and just watch that it's falling when accuracy is falling. But if F1 starts to rise, even though accuracy, or sorry, accuracy goes up, but even though accuracy is, is still getting better, if, if F1 starts to fall, maybe that's a sign that I'm now entering overfitting territory. I haven't really seen it, but I, I wonder if, if potentially that could be used. I think that that's actually a pretty good idea. I guess the big question is, what is overfitting? How would you know if there were an oracle that could tell you what overfitting were? Or, I'm sorry, if, if you were, your model were overfit, how would you define that? Yeah, so, so the definition I think of overfitting is that your model does not generalize. And so in cross-validation, if you're doing five-fold validation, if your model doesn't generalize to the other 20%, then it's pretty good you know, odds that it's not gonna to generalize to all the unseen data out there in the world. Um, so it's not a perfect measure, but you know, it, it does tend to work um, quite well. Mm, because think, if you're talking about a oh, sorry, metric, go ahead. if you're talking about a metric, right? It's gotta be something that can measure your model somehow. Like if, I don't know, if you were doing polynomial regression and you were adding terms to your polynomial, well, we know that you can fit any number of data points with enough terms on the polynomial. But if you, I don't know, could somehow think of how like twisty and bendy and curvy the polynomial gets, you could say, okay, it seems like this thing's getting pretty bent out of shape. Maybe this thing is overfit, right? it might be specific to what kind of model you're pursuing to say, okay, there are these characteristics that I associate with an overfit state. But if what you're talking about is the, the model doesn't generalize, then it's, I don't know, it's kind of like um, an empirical question. It's unknowable until you get some more data and try it out on that. Uh, basically, yes, it is in some ways unknowable, and that's why cross-validation really is about you have extra data that you hold out so that you can test it on extra data. I would say that, you know, when we look at something like a polynomial regression in one variable, we can visualize it, we can see it. I think the lessons from that are, one, if you know something about the, the problem that you're trying to solve, 
okay? That's always good information um, to have. So if you know something about the relationship between whatever, uh, you know, air temperature and the, and the weather, and you're trying to predict whether or not it's gonna rain, like by all means, you should incorporate that information in your, in your, 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 your feature engineering and, and, and whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, ultimately, if we are doing, say again, a CNN to do a, a, a computer vision classification problem, I actually don't know whether or not, you know, a particular neuron in the third layer should be smooth or if it should look like a ninth degree polynomial when it's when it's trying to analyze, you know, the, the you know the way the way parts of that image looks. So if I don't even know whether it should or it shouldn't be that, then I can't really say just from like look that you know it's overfit. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, well, I guess there's Occam's razor, right? The simplest explanation is most likely to be correct. Maybe you could try to measure complexity that way. And if you see complexity accumulating somewhere, that could set off some alarm bells. Yes, yes, I think we definitely do that. We say that if you, uh, the, the idea of parsimony, if you have one thing that's more complex and it works about the same as something that's less complex, let's go with the less complex thing. And in some areas, um, an alternate metric could be generated based on, say, a totally independent data set, right? So most of the times we get a data set, we split it into train and test, and use the train to partially train and validate, and then use the test set, right, to test the final model. But if we had an independent data set that was not a part of what we created the train and test from, then that's another alternate metric to get to validate and check for overfit. Yeah. So especially in the medical field, I think I uh, just uh, heard some someone say that uh, they always believe in getting an independent set where there's they're gathering data from a totally independent region, in, uh, different set of age groups, different kind of individuals, uh, so that they can test some of the other models. I guess at a high level, you can think of overfitting as the machine learning to make an assumption that isn't necessarily true in the real world. That's right. That that assumption does not generalize. The 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 the, the right the sixty five thousand dollar question is when is making an assumption. How do you know if that's a good assumption or a bad assumption? And and then, other than testing it on new data, I don't know that we have any real way out of the box. Yeah, I mean, For, it sounds like a halting problem almost. It is, but but we have sort of empirical ways. So so basically, you know, like I said, uh, if you if you know, if you haven't done a lot of, of cross validation training, I mean, you know, cross validation is is really the the standard go to and it works really really well. Also, you know, don't I'm sorry, go on. Uh, I realize that I know one example of cross-validation in real life. And it is strangely enough about how French people teach their kids to eat well and di diverse food. And they have a rule at the table that they provide some new food and a child is supposed to have two bites. And then, well, if he likes, he can continue to eat. If he doesn't, he's free to dump it. And in, you know, in a while they try it again because it could be that new child, I mean, in some while people can like it. Mm -hmm. So this is an interesting example. Yeah, yeah. It's a little bit, it's a little bit like cross validation. So every so often you try. All right, cool. Um, the other things they talk about, they, they, they talk about regularization, which, which we use. So it's interesting to see regularization talked about outside, again, outside of ML. Basically what they were saying is, is, is um, uh, what was mentioned earlier, you penalize complexity. Um, 
there was a, a, a little part there where they talked about um, evolution. And they said that basically, if you had an evolutionary mechanism that was quick to overfit, then over thousands of years, you probably would have a species that at some point would overfit and then would have disastrous abilities to cope with some new phenomenon. Um, and so, in fact, it's, it's important that your evolutionary mechanism is a little bit on the slow side, that it doesn't overfit too quickly. Uh, and then they also introduce early stopping. Um, not quite sure if I, if I necessarily <laughs> tracked with their analogy of how early stopping looks in the, uh, the real world, but basically what they were saying which I, I'm okay with, is that if you don't have a lot of, of certainty in your, it, and you don't have a lot of data, then it's, it's probably not worthwhile to just, you know, go nuts and taking a, a long time and, you know, uh, making decisions because you probably don't have enough data to, to actually build a complex model. You're probably at best just going to be overfitting if you do that type of you know, analysis. And so I think they, you know, went back to the beginning of the chapter where they talked about, should I, shouldn't I propose to the girl? And, you know, the answer is, you know, you don't really have all that many um, inputs and, you know, you like her. So yes, you should go and propose. All right. Anything else? All right. Um, going to see if I can't get through the next couple chapters kind of quickly. So they talk about relaxation. Um, so the example they gave is the traveling salesman problem. So what is the optimal route, least distance to travel between and different cities, hitting each city exactly once? Um, and, you know, that problem is, is believed to be NP hard. So it's, it's not solvable in polynomial time. It's not tractable. Um, so then there are things you can do. You can do constraint relaxation. Uh, you can get rid of some of the, the, the constraints. And so, for example, the minimum spanning tree problem is solvable. Um, you can do continuous relaxation. So they talked about, like, if you're trying to place firehouses, you can find the optimal solution with fractional values. And then you can just kind of, you know, do some jiggering to turn those fractional values back into integers. And then they also talk about uh, Lagrangian relaxation where you take some of the rules and instead of having them be rules, you just have them be penalties. So I think you can even think of like regularization as, as being some, sort of something like this. Um, and uh, they talk about sports scheduling. Um, uh, it's not clear to me if the sports scheduling world actually uses Lagrangian relaxation, but it is clear that they do violate the rules. So there's all these things that they say they want to be true in the schedule. And, and um, oftentimes I, I think it turns out that it's impossible to meet all the rules. And so therefore they have to have some other way of doing it. And not clear to me if they really used Lagrangian relaxation, but they do have to ultimately let go of some of the rules. Oh, I, I had something I wanted to, to add. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if overfitting isn't more common than we might imagine. Like if you thought about being able to recognize an object as largely about, I don't know, edge detection and shading. If I swapped around, you know, the colors and textures of your world, at least for a little while, you would be really disoriented, right? So you're clearly getting some information about texture. You know, you see, you know, this is blue and you, you think, oh, that's my textbook or something like that. So maybe what we've done with things like autonomous cars and stuff like that is that, I don't know, maybe if you throw enough data and computing power at something, its version of overfitting is general enough for us. Yeah, I don't know. If you go to Wikipedia and you, you look up cognitive biases, right? Um, there's there's gazillions of these. And I, I think that generally speaking, any place where you have some bias, that's that's you overfitting. You, you've got some past data and you are now generalized, you're generalizing in a way that's just not accurate with the real world. 
And even the best chosen model is, is turns out to be an overfit model due to uh, the assumptions changing and model weak, right? So the data changes, even your yep. best model from the past is now an overfit model. Yeah, yeah, so there's just so many ways that um, if you have you know data drift, there's just so many ways in which, you, yes, your model no longer generalizes. Thanks. All right, um, randomness. Uh, I think it's really interesting how certain algorithms require that you have random numbers. And you know, they don't necessarily need to be truly random, but they at least need to be, you know, random looking. Um, so they give the example of a primality test. Um, I was gonna talk about bloom filters. We've talked about them before, but I, I think bloom filters are just so cool. They're mentioned in the book, but they don't really go into the detail. Um, but I think it's pretty awesome that uh, you can use this data structure to see whether or not, you know, you've seen a particular key before. Um, and it can't tell you with 100% certainty um, that you've seen it before because there are some, some false positives. Um, but it can tell you with absolute certainty, uh, whenever, whenever it says we haven't seen this before, then, then, then you know, you know with 100% certainty. Um, we talked about how Bloom filters uh, in the previous book, um, Designing Data Intensive Applications, um, you know, there's a place where basically you can do this expensive lookup, but instead of just going and doing the lookup like naively, it checks a Bloom filter before uh, um, it does the expensive lookup. And most of the time the Bloom filter will, you know, um, tell it it doesn't need to do the expensive lookup. And so that's pretty, pretty awesome. Um, anyway, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna talk about any more, but, but if you're curious, like look up Bloom filters there, they're really cool. And again, this is this probabilistic thing. Um, it's not a deterministic algorithm. It doesn't always give you a yes, no answer. Um, it can give you a no answer, but it can't give you a, a guaranteed yes answer. And they talk about some hill climbing, simulated annealing, um, and there's just all sorts of ways that randomness is used. It's used in like autoencoders. Um, obviously, within training, you know, you do things like augmentations. But uh, randomness is is necessary for your for doing things like say random crops and contrastive learning. So, um, thought that was really cool. And 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 uh, it's interesting to see, like, I don't know if I can explain this, but you know, there's times when you use just random things because you're like, heck, I'm just gonna pick something random. I don't need, you know, something. And then there's other times when you have an algorithm which kind of depends on the randomness that if you had too much interrelation between your choices, it wouldn't work. So that's why I think it's really cool is when you have algorithms that depend on randomness. All right, um, there's a chapter on networking, uh, which I never really thought about it too much, but of course, I guess the, the rules and network protocols, those are algorithms. Um, and, and perhaps the most relatable thing was this idea of exponential back off. And, and so the, the author calls it the algorithm of forgiveness because it never completely gives up. And so they gave an example about like, if you have some friend who's a flake, then instead of just writing them off, what you could do is you could just exponentially uh, decrease, you know, the amount of, I think in the book it's invitations, but you could just sort of decrease it, um, but never actually completely give up. And so I don't know if anybody has an example where, where they've actually used that in their life, but I thought that was kind of a nice idea um, I use that all the time. Yeah. So like what's yeah. something that you exponentially back off? Exactly that. What, friends? Yeah, like or if I'm getting to know someone and I uh, and I haven't heard from them. I mean, I do have a cutoff, so I don't constantly occupy myself with it. But like I might message them you know, once and then a couple days later and then like four days, then like I'm maybe eight and then I just give up. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I definitely use that because it saves you a lot of trouble because generally when people want to hang out with you and have time, right? 
you're almost certainly going to pick a time in their lives when they are, you know, they'll just pick up the phone or answer your text or whatever. But with this, you save yourself from annoying that person and wasting your time. If like, I don't know, let's say they're out of the country on vacation for a week, right? By using an exponential back off, you then text them again. And they're like, oh, hey, you're here. And um, you would be surprised. Like, uh, I got uh, a meetup DM from someone I had reached out to a while ago. And they're like, oh, hey, I don't check these very often. Here are my contacts. And I still haven't gotten back to them. So I'm just a lazy bum. You know, since exponent increase in infinitely and human life is finite then it does mean that at some point you completely give something up i suppose that's true but but it does seem cognitively to spare you the the active choice of like cutting somebody off you know oh yes (laughs) right if you say okay i went five years and (laughs) I went 10 years and maybe, you know, I won't live another 20 years, but at least, you know, I haven't consciously, if if you don't want to, you don't have to cut them. Maybe also child rearing, where you slowly allow the child more control over time. And then eventually you give them the car keys. That's interesting. All right. We can have a whole session talking about that. And the fact that no matter how what exponential back off or other algorithm you use, then your children won't appreciate it. <laughs> the no free lunch theorem of <laughs> child rearing. You just haven't waited long enough. <laughs> All right, we're over time. I'm just gonna blow through. Uh, so game theories has some very interesting things. Uh, uh, I think it's cool. Like, you know, they talked about that, that you can reach this Nash equilibrium. Um, uh, and that the the mechanism design says instead of trying to find like you know the the optimal policies that people might use that that somehow cooperate better, maybe what you can do is you can change the design of the game. And it's interesting that even by you know making the outcomes worse for everyone, it can actually shift the way the equilibrium moves. And so they give an example of this Vickery auction. Um, and so, you know, the tweak from the English auction is that once you have one person who is the highest bid and they win, instead of them paying what they bid, they actually pay what the second place person bid. Um, and so by that tweak of the rules, it actually incentivizes honesty. So I thought that was kind of a cool thing. Obviously, we could do a whole book on game theory, right? All right. So uh, explore, exploit, just uh, in, in sort of a... Um, uh, capsule form. So this book talks about the multi-arm bandit problem. So if you're not familiar with slot machines being called one-arm bandits. Um, so the idea is, you know, you're, you're playing one particular machine and you see how often it's, it's giving rewards. And, you know, we'll just model these as, as IID events, okay? Maybe real slot machines don't work that way, but we'll just model it that way. Um, and, and so then it's like, well, okay, so let's say I'm winning 25% of the time. Should I keep playing this slot machine or should I switch to a different one? And so then there's some different algorithms. Um, you have this simple one, win, stay, lose, shift. And so the idea is if you win, you should keep playing that slot machine. That seems logical. Um, but anytime you lose, you shift to a different one. So, uh, you know, you can kind of probe a little bit deeper. So if this machine paid out, you know, um, 19 out of 20 times, are you really gonna shift just after one loss? Maybe maybe depending on how well it's paying off, you should shift, you know, it should take you longer. And so that's where you get into these other algorithms. A very important concept is discounting future rewards. You see this in finance because there's a time cost of money. So you have interest rates. And so you have a difference between present value, future value. Um, This is basically a similar phenomenon. Um, And if you discount future rewards, that changes some of the math. And essentially this multi-arm bandit problem, you can actually solve. Um, And so you get the Gittins index. We'll see that in reinforcement learning that typically we are using discounted future rewards. And again, it makes the problem somewhat simpler because 
hey, if you have this payoff of 10, but it's a gazillion years from now, the discounting means ultimately that I don't have to worry about it so much because it'll get discounted so much that it's irrelevant. Um, there's a concept of regret. Regret is used also in reinforcement learning and you get a slightly different um, way of modeling things. So rather than necessarily looking at the average rewards that you've gotten from a slot machine, okay, you can model this comp this idea of the upper upper confidence bound. So instead of just simply saying this is the actual number that I've gotten and I have a level of uncertainty about it, you can you can try to quantify that uncertainty and say here is my upper confidence bound. So a slot machine you've played 99 times, you may say, I think I have a pretty good sense for what it's worth, but this other one I only played twice and I won once. And so I don't necessarily think it's 50%, but the question is, do you, um, uh, so you get a different algorithm if you're comparing sort of what do you think is the best case and what do you think is the worst case? So upper confidence bound kind of looks at the best case um, or the, your different choices. And then what you can do is, um, as you start playing that other machine that has a high confidence bound just because of the high uncertainty, um, as you play it more, then your uncertainty shrinks. And so then eventually, if you, if you do infinitely many pulls on all the slot machines, then you get very accurate estimates of all of them. Um, but basically, it's, it's a way to, to basically um, um, decide when should you stick with the known and when should you actually try something different. And so uh, as we get into reinforcement learning, it's not necessarily a uh, something that's 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 constantly talked about uh, because you're kind of talking about more other things in terms of calculating rewards and whatnot. But ultimately you will see this idea of like you cannot just always do the thing that you think is best because uh, until you've exhaustively explored explored all the options uh, there could be something better out there and so there's always going to be some element of something like an epsilon greedy algorithm where um, a small epsilon percent of the time you need to try something different even though it's not um, what you think and and over time you can shrink epsilon you can do things but ultimately um, you do need to do. You do need to trade off some amount of exploring in order to, um, uh, in order to make sure that you don't get stuck in a rut in a local maximum. And so, in terms of our personal lives, then they talk a little bit about. Uh, if you think about sort of, you have this interval, right? So we, the very first chapter, we talked about, hey, if you say I have one month to hire a person, what if it's not one month? What if it's three months? And so the idea is that uh, the more time that you think you have, really the more you should be exploring. So the earlier you are in your career, the earlier you are in relationships, the earlier you are in whatever, more time for exploring. And then when you think you're getting sort of towards the late end of the interval, if you think that the Hollywood business model is gonna break down, it's not gonna last much longer than just exploit, exploit, exploit. Just do things that you think you know work. Um, uh, it's, not, it's not time to try something new. So um, that, was, that was a pretty rapid pass through Explore Exploit, but, um, but hopefully it's a good tease. And if you're interested in more about this, then um, in two weeks, we are gonna do the introduction to reinforcement learning session. All right, so I think we, uh, a couple people may have already dropped, but uh, thank you for those of you who stayed through the, the whole session. Um, any final comments, questions about Explore Exploit or, or anything else from the book? I have a visualization for upper confidence bound. I can show you if you want. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll let you do that in just one moment. Mm -hmm. um, so then uh, the, the last thing that the authors say is they talk about you know, computational kindness. They give an example of um, if you added an 18 cent coin, it would minimize the number of coins needed to make change. But it's really hard to calculate when should you use this 18 cent coin or not. And so they say that's not a very computationally kind way 
of doing things. So it, in practice, if you had a two or three cent coin, mm -hmm. people could actually use it and it wouldn't require a lot of work for them to figure out when to use it. So that's, that's when you're sort of solving general problems. But then they also say, hey, also be kind to yourself. So in learning about all these things, we found that there's lots of problems that aren't tractable and lots of problems that don't have uh, a single optimal, easy to calculate solution. So don't be hard on yourself if you actually sometimes um, don't have an exact solution. And so you just need to ultimately make, make a choice and just know that that's the way life is and there's nothing uh, wrong with you, that that's just in fact uh, the world, that it's complex enough that you can't always just know what the right choice is. Um, so cut yourself some slack that sometimes you just have to make the best choice with the information you have. And that is in fact rational and that is optimal just in terms of the way the world is with the limited information that you have. All right, so then I will stop things here. Um,